Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 101 of Small Business War Stories. And it is early in 2019. I want to kick off this year with a really positive, amazing episode that I recorded with Kara Pendle of Caracotta Ceramics here in Austin, Texas. And Kara is an exceptional, exceptional woman. Uh, we actually spend very little time talking about ceramics. There's a few stories in there about ceramics, but a lot of it is about... Uh, really the belief that it takes to start a small business and how you can turn that belief into action. Uh, she is in the process of writing a book. We talk a little bit about the ideas that she is going to be sharing in her book about how to, I mean, the, the basic premise is how with anything you choose to do um, as a uh, as a small business person, how you can make $100,000 in the first year of doing that, whether you're doing photography, ceramics, uh, consulting, whatever it is that you're doing as a small business. So it's an incredibly powerful um, set of ideas. And a lot of it has to do, we do get a little bit into, um, I don't know, I, want, I don't want to say like a little bit of the woo-woo metaphysical sort of realm of like how your intentions and your thoughts manifest themselves into reality. But I firmly believe that. I've been learning more and more about that. I've recently been going through a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's a classic from 1937. And we discuss some of the ideas in that book, as well as how Kara has, she has, I mean, she's been extraordinarily successful as a software entrepreneur. Uh, she's also had yoga studios. And now she's having her ceramics business. And she has found different things that really work for her. And this is really inspiring for me. I learned a lot. Uh, and I have been listening to this episode a couple of times, uh, you know, a few times before it even released because it's been helping me so much. So I hope it'll help you as well. This episode is brought to you by Proven. Proven.com is a company that I started. Go check it out at Proven.com and blog.proven.com is an excellent resource for small businesses where you see all the archive of small business war stories as well as uh, different articles about how to more efficiently run and, and your small business and, and how to succeed. So let's, without further ado, let's get into this episode here that's going to help you kick off your energy right for 2019 or for whenever it is that you're listening uh, to this episode with Kara Pendle of Caracotta Ceramics in Austin, Texas. And we are live here in beautiful Austin, Texas. <laughs> And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Kara Pendle of Caracotta. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's I'm so, so excited to be here. It's very exciting to have you here. And we met at an event called ATX Gals. Well, it's really kind of a series of events called ATX mm -hmm. Gals, uh, put on by a mutual friend of ours, Monica. Uh, Monica Senecedos, who does uh, a lot of really cool things with mm -hmm. the women's art community in Austin. And you were exhibiting your work there. I was. <laughs> and uh, so let's talk a little bit about what you do and also what, you, I mean, I remember talking about like you, you have a lot of plans to do more and, and new things. Uh, yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, let's talk about your your business and how, you know, the, the art that you make and how you turn that into a business. Ooh, that is a big loaded question. Yeah. Um, That's what we do here at Small Business <clears throat> stores. Well... Let's see. How did I turn it into a business? Well, first of all, let's, for our audience's benefit, what do you what do you do? What do yeah. You do? Um, so, like you said, I am the founder and artist of Caracotta Ceramics. Um, we are a functional, mostly functional based ceramic company out of Austin, and um, recently I've been transitioning into doing more of. Um, I guess more visual art, which is what you saw at the ATX Gal show. Um, how I got started in it was totally kind of by a fluke, but very much in connection to the Steve Jobs quote, uh, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Yeah, that's backwards. from the Stanford commencement speech. Yes. I just listened to that. I made a very important decision in my life about two weeks ago. So yes. yeah. It's very, everybody should listen to it if you haven't yet. Yeah. Um, I originally took ceramics in high school, and mm -hmm. it was the first time in my life that I felt totally connected and in love with something, and it was just 
it resonated so naturally and deeply with me, but I had never seen somebody be a full-time artist. So that wasn't something that even crossed my mind. Um, and I kept doing it as just kind of a hobby and a passion. When I went to college, I just took classes on the side, still totally loved it. Um, I went a completely different direction with my career that at the time I could never have seen how ceramics was going to intersect back without what I was doing. So I went to school for marketing. I um, started a career doing new store openings for different retail companies. Mm. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and then I transitioned into having a software company and I eventually owned a yoga studio. And the whole time I was doing ceramics, again, as kind of a stress reliever and a creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And maybe about five years ago, I had this real coming to Jesus moment where I'd been journaling a lot about what do I want the next 10 years to look like. And I just kept coming back to the same answer that it would be incredible to do ceramics every day, all day, but like, can people really do that? Um, and I just had this kind of realization that I had so much belief in myself for running the software business and having the yoga studio and being able to make money and, and live a sustainable life in those different businesses. Why, when I add my art into it, does it seem like this can't be a business? So yeah. I dove really into a lot of that and yeah. then kind of came up with some solutions that would work for me. And then I would love to hear those <laughs> because I actually struggle with that sometimes too, right? Yeah. So with my music, with my photography, with uh, the guitars that I make. Yeah. Uh, even this, you know, <clears throat> this podcast. And we were just talking before the show uh, that, you know, how do you turn what you really, I mean, I love doing this more than anything else. How do you turn doing what you absolutely love into the, the big thing you do? Mm -hmm. So what were your insights? So I think the biggest thing for anyone is to take out kind of the word art or any um, connotation that you're making it means something besides just business. So when I really distill down, what do I want this ceramics passion? Like, how could it actually make money? The same exact principles of, okay, I'm going to need a client avatar. I'm going to need a marketing strategy. I'm going to need a product line. Like, all these same things that are going to be the same no matter what business that you're in. And when you can take out um, that content of what you're actually making or doing and just get back to the basics, I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. Okay, and myself included. That's a really, so that, that's a powerful idea. Let's unpack it a little bit more. So you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, to stop looking at it through the prism of this is what I make and start looking at the prism of who is this for, why, and how do you convey that to that customer? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the very, very, very first step that you have to do if you're, if you're wanting to do this specifically for uh, artistic or creative project, if you're wanting to turn that into a business, is to really get honest with yourself and say, do I want to just create for creation's sake or do I want to make money from this? And really, truly looking at that question and having a passionate answer one way or the other. Um, and if the answer is, I want it to be a business, then yes, sitting down and looking at who am I, who wants to buy this, um, I think is I think probably the most important question to mm -hmm. ask right away up front because yeah. that your client avatar and who you're building this for is going to inform every other decision that you're going to make about it. We, we should probably highlight that. I mean, I think you'll agree with me that either answer is okay. Right? Oh, yeah. If you, if you yeah. want to continue to do it as a, as a hobby or as a, your stress release, your therapy. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, just just know that that's what you're doing. Exactly. Because your strategy is going to look totally different. If you're just creating to make creation's sake, like that can free up so much mental space for you, um, creative energy. When people come to you and say, oh, you should sell this and you, you should do this and that, to be able to really powerfully stand there and say, you know what, I have thought that through and I am just making to make this and um, maybe someday, but it's not happening yeah, right now. That's how, I, that's how I feel about guitar. So I make... A a handful of guitars a year, probably like a net three or four, and people have offered me money for them. And I decided that I, I I only make them for artists that I work with. Yeah. Because it's an important creative outlet for me, and I love seeing a piece of wood take shape into an instrument. Mm -hmm. But it's not something I want to turn into a business. And it total that's it's yeah. so freeing. But to this say that. podcast, so this that, you know, that's different, right? Yeah. It's like this I see as art. That also is something that is I you know I want it to be a powerful thing. That's. And that, in the same vein, that frees you up so much to yeah. be able to powerfully say, like, I am here to make money. I do want this to be a lucrative 
endeavor, people will come out of the woodwork then to help you when they know that you're looking for help and you're wanting this to go in a different direction then. Yeah, just not only that, you're man- we were talking about the book, Think and Grow Rich, mm-hmm. which is on the table here, um, which is a book that I only recently discovered and it's really been changing my life. You read it a long time ago or a while ago? I read it um, maybe 22, 23. My parents have a copy of it. Okay, so. yeah. And I always thought it was kind of this cheesy like 1930s book because a lot of, you know, I don't know, for some reason it was a judgment that I had that was completely unfair because <laughs> I picked it up at uh, Half Price Books, awesome uh, Austin local business mm-hmm. that are frequent, and uh, it's changed my life. It's, because, And let's talk a little bit about it because I think it do- dovetails to what you're talking about, like mm-hmm. the intention setting and manifestation of like this is going to be my business and how forces in the, you know, in the ether and like in society and like your vibrations and your uh, intention results in people coming out of the woodwork to help you out. It, absolutely. Manifestation, I can't say it highly enough. I mean, when you think this, everybody's had this experience. When you are thinking about something, maybe it's like, I want to go to Florida or whatever. All of a sudden, Florida license plates coming are coming out of the woodwork. You're meeting people that are like, oh, I just got back from Orlando or whatever. That happens to everybody. That's not just a coincidence, kismet thing. You're manifesting that. You're pulling in that energy. So because we are on the cusp of 2019, um, and I know that this year is going to be, if, if anybody's into astrology, this is going to be a very prosperous, abundant year for a lot of people. Um, this right now, this quarter one, is definitely the time to be focusing on what you want to bring into your business in the next year. Okay. Yeah. What are some techniques? Yeah, because... I have to confess that prior to um, really going through the book and taking you know twenty or thirty pages of my mm-hmm. own notes on the book and as well as writing all over the book, some of the things, some of the concepts there, this concept of like thinking and bringing your energy sounds a little woo woo. Sure does. <laughs> um, but I've been practicing some of the stuff and it's you know it's been early and like it, it is it does there are, there's there is something to it and there are I mean this is. We're getting to some metaphysical realms here, but mm-hmm. that there's there's some folks that that have talked uh, you know at length about how uh, you know affirmations mm-hmm. and 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 basically coaching your subconscious to manifest the thoughts into reality. There's it's more than just a woo woo thing. Like, oh, absolutely. Is, yeah. I mean, so what are some of the things you do? Yeah, like, exact kind of what you said. Like hypnosis and manifesting are. I think pretty interchangeable and all that it is basically is saying that you are going to be training your subconscious to seek out opportunities that Mm -hmm. maybe your conscious mind would miss. Right. And we don't really know how the subconscious works truly, you know, but what they do know is that you can, you can plant seeds in it that exact will do exactly that will help you start seeking out opportunities that, Maybe otherwise, just like the license plate example, um, you can do that manifesting hypnosis, whatever you want to call it. I just like to think of it as um, meditating with a goal in mind. So that's how I like to manifest. So if I say maybe for 2019, a goal is that, well, right now I'm looking for a literary agent. So that is what I'm meditating on, manifesting trying to self hypnotize myself with Mm -hmm. is that I will find the perfect literary agent in the beginning of the new year. And I just keep imagining having that perfect meeting with that person, signing the contract, um, envisioning it enough that I can feel it embodied. And it's really that easy. And if it does sound a little, let's talk, well, let's be super specific (laughs) though, because some of the stuff when, when you're saying that, um, I mean, I'll be happy to share some of the things that I'm doing, but yeah. like, what are the specific things you do? You're saying that you're, you're, you're kind of talking about, it's just like one step removed from the actual thing you're doing. You're like, you're thinking about these things. So what do you do? You, what, what time of day is it? What are you doing? Are you writing these things down? Are you mm-hmm. saying them out loud to yourself? What mm-hmm. are you doing? It depends on what the goal is, okay. but I do a little bit of all that. I, I personally like to meditate in the morning. I feel like I'm the freshest and the most concentrated. Um, and, but I will, I also, every year at the beginning of the year, I write out what my goals are going to be for that year. I put it in a note in my phone. Yeah. It's something I reference all the time. Um, I like to do vision boards. I think that can be really powerful yeah. depending on how, if you're more of a visual or auditory learner. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think meditation though, for me has been the most powerful as far as being able to manifest things into my life and seeing it really truly happen. Um, and again, it's just 
kind of focusing on whatever the goal is and envisioning the experience actually happening until you can feel the excitement inside of you of okay. what that so would So you do like. it in, in your mind's eye. You, you're not mm-hmm. writing this down or, or saying it necessarily. I don't really journal about it. Like I'll write okay. out what the actual goal is mm-hmm. in present tense as if it's already happened. Interesting. Again, so give me an example of that with a literary agent. Yeah, so what, so what would be the, your written goal? Then? It would be I have the perfect literary agent launching whatever the book is going to be named. It has a working title, but... Right. <laughs> well, we'll have, you, we'll have you back on the show when you launch yeah. the book. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book myself so yeah. about this show, about all the things that I've learned around the country. And it's, well, writing it too in present tense is another one of the tricks with tricking your subconscious mind into yeah. thinking that it's already happened. So you keep pulling in those experiences and opportunities that will align your conscious mind with what your subconscious thinks is true. Right. So, so basically saying, instead of saying, I am going to publish right. the book about small business war stories, it's yeah. like... I have published a book about small business war stories yeah. and it's a bestseller. Yeah. It's right. it's even just having that small shift in it, it feels so much more powerful yeah. to say I'm going to do this or I am doing it or I have done it. Interesting. So you, you look at it as like fair complete. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Okay. What are, and what are some of the, I mean, I'd love to get back into the whole business side, but this is actually really, because I'm currently going through this exact process. Mm-hmm. I'm doing actually five-year goals, then two-year goals, mm-hmm. one-year goals, and six-month goals. Mm-hmm. And I'm implementing this thing that my friend Dustin Romney just taught me about where he, uh, he's a very successful technology sales guy. He's a good friend of mine. He lives in, uh, he lives up in Montana. I stayed with him uh, during the tour when I interviewed some folks up there. Mm-hmm. And he says that he looks at Mondays, the day that he's a manager, mm. and the other days he's an employee. So he basically, Monday, all he does is like set the exact tasks and schedules mm-hmm. for everything else that needs to happen that week and thinks about everything that needs to happen. Yes. And then for the rest of the days, he basically just executes on exactly that, right? So my goal is to kind of almost come down all the way down from five-year goals, two-year goals, Mm one-year goals, six-month goal to that Monday everyday execution, right, Mm -hmm. as a way to really get get things going and I, I, how, do, how do you see that I mean do you do any any planning like that how do you how do you manage your workflow I do a version of that more so on a day-to-day basis versus Monday for the rest of the week but okay. every day that's how I start the day so as soon as I get into the studio in the morning I make a list of the important things and the things that like absolutely have to get done today so um and then I usually try to do the tasks that I hate the most first okay. that's <laughs> smart get it out of the way and then um the rest of the afternoon goes so much smoother but yeah every morning i get in there i spend at least 10 to 30 minutes just kind of outlining the day um i'm a super stickler about how often i'll check my email yeah so i check my email usually at seven when i wake up and then 11 like right before i break for lunch and then again at three o'clock i will check it at night at night um <clears throat> but I really do during the day try to stick to those time. So frames. you don't check your email during the day. I try not to. That's smart. <laughs> That's so smart. I've been actually doing that recently. Uh, I just recently upgraded my phone, and what I did is now I have a work phone that has all the apps and all the stuff. Mm-hmm. But my old phone now has only text, um, voice, mm-hmm. and Spotify and Maps. Meaning there's no apps, there's Brilliant. no email, there's no anything. Yeah. So then when I go out. And I'm like engaged. So like I, if I need it, you know, a car, if I need something like that, that's available. Mm -hmm. But I took out all the apps that where I spend these endless loops of like what I call the uh, dopamine random generator, Mm -hmm. random reward generator of like social media and and, and email and and, and looking for that red bubble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The email email is the worst. It really is. Like you can get in such a rabbit hole of it. Um, I'm also a believer of zero, inbox zero. I know. (laughs) God bless your soul. <laughs> I think I've never really it. Okay, well, just for one week, try to set a timer even on your phone. Every email that comes in, whenever you have your your email constraints, yeah. and you're going to check it for thirty minutes, make yourself a promise that <clears throat> you will answer every email that comes in. That's been that's been in since the last time you checked it. Because usually why we don't answer them is because we think, oh, this is going to like require a lot of work or I'm going to need to like really think about this. Yeah. It's just procrastinating. It just, you can, you can do it. Just do it. So, I mean, I've heard a version of this, which is that you want to touch every piece of paper once when this, where people did it with mail. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So then, but you don't believe in, so let's, let's say something will take longer though. How do you delegate that into like a future task or? Well, have you ever read or heard about the monkey on your back theory about how people are just constantly, there's like monkeys on people's backs and you're just going around trying to like get rid of the monkeys on your back onto somebody else's. And no, the whole... tell, tell me about it. <laughs> I, it we're, it's a podcast with many allegories. Let's, just, okay, let's talk about that. Well, the whole concept is that everybody, so if somebody sends you an email and they have a whole bunch of asks in it, one thing to do is to email them back and put as much of it back on them as you can to get the monkeys off your back and get it onto somebody else's or <laughs> mitigate out whatever <coughs> questions or <I> issues. Just... <coughs> <laughs> Some of the water is drinking one down the wrong pipe. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. So you're going back to, so you want to explain the monkey thing again? So you're... You... Yeah, so if somebody, um, let let me give you an example of something that just recently happened. So I do a lot of events and pop-ups and people will oftentimes ask me for collateral. So they want photos or they want copy or whatever it is. And they'll send me a whole email with all these asks, asks in it. And in the past, I could have taking the time to send them back like a different bio that's kind of tailored to what they are looking for. Um, I could seek out the photos that I know are in my Google Drive that would match what they have. But instead of doing that, if you're going to be cutthroat with your email and get to zero, you could just email them back and say, here is my website bio. Feel free to edit to whatever works for you guys. Here's a link to my uh, Google Drive with all of my photos. Right. Feel free to look through and use what's going to work. So it's for almost you. like an EPK, an electronic press kit. Yeah, yeah, yes. And with the monkeys off your back, it's kind of just the idea of push back on the work that they're asking from you and let them do it. Okay. All right. Yeah. And you you have a very busy schedule. I mean, we're right now. It's the it's the what are ten days before Christmas now. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's a, this is probably one of the busiest times of the year for you. Yeah. It's amazing that you're even taking the time to record this now. We could have done this, you know, December 27th. But um, what are some of the things you're juggling? So you were telling me about all the different, you know, shows, pop-ups you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This Well, holiday is, you know, it's very busy. For anybody who's in the maker world, September to January. If you know any makers in your life, send them during this time, September to January. Send flowers, cards, just literally any kind of support. Um, you know, the bulk of our business really does happen this time of the year. Um, and I have a pretty robust wholesale business. So those boutiques and those stores obviously need a lot of product. Um, and then I also do retail, like direct retail. So I'm also filling orders right now for just everyday consumers. And then this is also a big time of the year for hurt shows and um, pop-ups. So mm-hmm. lots of and lots going on, but I am going to be taking off about a month, starting on Tuesday. I'll be off the nineteenth wow. through the end of or middle of January. Wow, what, so. are you, what are you going to do? Honestly, I'm just gonna. I feel a little bit like a shell of a human right now. It's been a very, very compressed yeah. fall and winter season. Yeah. Um, I brought on my first employee this fall, so it's been. Yeah. There's been a lot happening, and I'm just really looking forward to taking that. Taking a nap. <laughs> yeah. I want to read a book. I want to like make a sauce for dinner. Just, make you know. Make a sauce for dinner. Yeah. Like just go to a coffee shop. I'm like, what do, what do people do? Where do I, what do I, how do I do this? I don't remember. But okay. um, yeah, I'm going to. And you're able to generate enough sales throughout the rest of the year that you're fine with that. Yeah. I mean, my goal really is what I had just said earlier. Like this is uh, traditionally a really busy year or time of the year for makers. My goal is to have um, that stableness and sustainability 12 months a year. So I don't want it to be a peak in sales from September to January. That's the goal. Um, And so, yes, there will be enough carryover work that will happen in January and February um, that will. So somebody else, your employee is going to mind the shop. She'll be working. Yeah, she'll be doing um, a lot of projects. And then I also have pre-booked out some pretty big projects Mm -hmm. that will be coming um, together in the end of January and February. I'm doing a couple of big What kind commission- of, can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing two um, bigger commission pieces. And then I'm doing some stuff for the Contemporary in Austin, which is an art gallery is opening a new retail space. Okay. So I'm doing a special collaboration with them and that'll be coming at the end of January. So and what, what exactly are you making? What is- I'm th- they're getting some Copita little tasting cups. Okay. Um, 
and they're getting some special bowls and smudge items. So okay. energy clearing, more woo woo things. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, no, no, I, I'm yeah. all about the woo. I mean, yeah. you gave me one of those. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you use it? I have not yet used it because it's got instructions. It's it complicated. Does. <laughs> I got, it's not. It's not. I light incense every day, but it's, I was like, man, this has got. I got to think about this. Okay, no, light it. Yeah. <laughs> it works. I, I, actually, I think it might be. It's, it's somewhere on here. Yeah. Uh, I'll look at. I'll look at uh, right after we we stop recording here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's um, those custom works will be happening. And then I also want to spend a big chunk of January writing this book. So, yeah. so what's your book about? So the book is about how to make $100,000 in your first year of business as an artist or a creative entrepreneur. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And I think it's possible. I think it's possible for everyone. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what are some of the, uh, I mean, without giving away the mm -hmm. founder of the book, what are some of the things you're going to talk about? So one of the main, I mean, the very first thing that the book does is what we've already covered, like deciding that you want to make money as an artist. Again, there's no right answer to that. If you don't want to, that's totally cool too. Um, and then the, the next big thing is deciding how you want to make money. I'm a big proponent of having three legs to your business that are really healthy revenue streams. I try to coach people that one of those, if possible, should be in the education space. So that means whether or not you want to write content, have a book, have an ebook, host workshops, um, anything like that. If you can have one of your arms be an education piece, okay, that's a huge win. Okay. Um, I also think if you're going to be in the maker art space, leading with your wholesale business is also something that I think is a strategy that really works. Okay. Um, a lot of people see that the margin is so much bigger when you sell direct to consumers yep. versus wholesale. Mm -hmm. But where I think people sometimes miss the ball is that getting one healthy wholesale account versus trying to find five or 10 clients, you know, it's how much time is that going to take you? Right. So, okay. Um, even if your margins are lower net net, it ends up working out. Right. Um, yeah, so the, so the you have the three pieces we're we're, we're the, the, our our stools falling over. We yeah. need a third leg. So we got <laughs> we got the education and uh, wholesale business. If yeah. you're making physical things, and what's the third one? Well, for makers, it would be for me. It's for, it's retail. Okay, but it could be commission projects. It could be if you were in food service, you could be doing something like cooking classes, catering, and your actual meal service or mm -hmm. you know delivery could be one of the things. Whatever it is, but um separating your business into those three chunks that if one of them falls over and goes dead, you still have the other two that are okay. healthy and you can work on the third one. Okay. So this is fascinating. So mm -hmm. how do you, let's say, let's say that I am a photographer. Mm -hmm. Let's actually, let's do something. So I'm a film photographer, mm -hmm. which I do do that, but I'm not currently trying to make money from it. Let's say that I wanted to, Let's just use it, you know specific example. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to make a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars next year as a film photographer. So you would encourage me to one, have something related to education, whether like writing a book about it or having a YouTube channel mm -hmm. talking about film photography. Right? Yep. The second thing would be to make sure I get my prints into wholesale shops. Yes. And my third thing would be to do direct sales through Instagram and things like that. Yeah, or booking private shoots for people. Yeah. Um, it could be yeah doing like print. Yeah. Uh, like magazine, whatever. What I tell people and what's worked for me is find something that you like doing and that you don't mind doing over and over and over again. Um, that's maybe not the full scope of what you're creatively yeah. able to do, but something that you really enjoy doing that can be just that's, a this, revenue driver. But this for you. podcast, is yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, it doesn't exactly generate a lot of revenues right now, but, we'll, but I'm looking could. to change it. Yeah. No, I will. 2019. Yes. This podcast it will have generated. Yeah. I mean, Start meditating yes, on it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So then it seems like $100,000 is mentally uh, a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. It's it's a big, it's, it's you know, the BHAG, the mm -hmm. big Harry Auditions mm -hmm. goal. But it's also overwhelming, right? So how do you kind of bridge that gap? Because uh, if I tell you that if you uh, go to the gym for the next year, you'll be able to... Uh, you know, say bench press more weight, you probably believe me and you might be motivated to do that. But if I tell you that by the end of the year, you have to build a rocket to go to the moon, uh, the, the, the task is so enormous that we get 
you know, overwhelmed, discouraged. Right. So I'm t- it's a little bit of an extreme example, but how do you bridge that gap from zero to $100,000 when you've never done that before? Right. I Well, I picked $100,000 because to me that was an amount that was a reach, but it wasn't crazy okay. that I already... Um, so you didn't say a million dollars, which would be the, uh, the equivalent of the moon. Right. Market. And so maybe it is for somebody else. Maybe a reach for you feels like 50000 or 30000 or whatever it is. You want it to be something, an amount in your head that feels scary and feels like a challenge and definitely n- not the amount that you're going to probably reach without trying very hard. You know, okay. so if that's going to be $20,000, then maybe you set it at forty. Um, and see how it goes for the first couple of months and yeah. whatever your sales are, then maybe you set it a little higher. But, um, yeah, I picked a hundred thousand dollars because to me, okay. it seems like it's like a good reach amount. Okay. So what else are you talking about in the book? Yeah. Um, so besides finding your three legs of your business, the way that the book kind of works, it's a little bit of a journal, a little bit of a workbook in the sense of it's the goal of it is putting together a business plan for you. So at the end of it, you have a whole outline of exactly what you need to do with your business. Because I personally believe that what trips up a lot of people is not having an action plan and looking at the scope of starting a business. And it just seems like there's so many different parts and where do I start first? And Secret, it's not with business cards. A lot of people want to get those printed right away. Don't do it. That's the very last step. Okay, let's talk about that. What do you mean? Oh, it, it, yeah. I, 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 that's true, actually. And that happened to me. I got hung up on what the name of my business would yeah. be. Yeah, yeah. Like that, that are, stuff's coming way later. Yeah, that's, that's like the very end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, your branding, your marketing materials, any of your collateral, like very last step. But... So yeah, so we're gonna work through the book um, and you're gonna get a whole, a whole action plan together. So it's gonna be laid out for you. You're gonna do X, Y, Z in a row. Yeah. And so you can say at the end of it, the only thing stopping you from having success, theoretically, is just taking action. Mm-hmm. So we wanna take out all the guesswork right. of what do you do next and... But to me, the important thing for that too is has been uh, breaking things down to the smallest possible mm-hmm. next step. Right. Exactly. Because if when you think about like, make poster, make poster is a big project. You mm-hmm. have to figure out what's on it. But it's like you know, uh, the next act, exact step would be you know, sketch outline of font for poster. Right. You know, and that 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 is small enough that okay, that's what I need to do. Yeah. Font outline. Yes. And it's not as overwhelming as make poster. Or, exactly. You know, yeah. So the book will feed you a lot of prompts yeah. to it and then you'll fill out and you can go at your own pace and That's then awesome. at the very end you'll be I need this book. ready to I go want, I want to and read it. same thing with the hundred thousand dollars or if you set it at 50 yeah. um, or 20 it's breaking that down to what does that mean a month a, a week a day and a lot of times when you back out of it i don't know what the math per day is i know per week it would be grossing like twenty five hundred dollars depending on obviously your expenses but let's mm-hmm. just say they were like twenty thousand dollars a year um you and so I don't know how much that would be a day. What is? What do you mean? Twenty five divided by seven. Twenty five. That's roughly four. Okay, so four you're making like four hundred bucks a day. Yeah. So when you break it down. No, I'm sorry. Small, no, you said twenty five divided by seven. Twenty five hundred. So yeah, so it would be a little bit under uh, four because seven times four is twenty eight. So it would be a little bit under four. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. Less you have to do a day. Yeah. <laughs> When you break it down that uh, that you, small, I wasn't expecting mental math questions <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> That's why I asked you because I couldn't it do it that yeah. fast. So, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Good. This is fascinating. Okay, so when is your book going to come out? Well, there's a lot of steps in between yeah. writing a book and, and this having is, it and published. This is part of your educational. Program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is part of the education arm of the business, um, and something that will be used to tie back in customers that have bought directly from me it'll be a product that i can hopefully pitch to my wholesalers that i already have a relationship with so there's a layered strategy to that um but hopefully it'll be out i'm hoping by next summer okay um i have done quite a bit of research on publishing a book I, yeah. i'm kind of trying to find this uh intersection of doing enough research to know what the next steps are but i i want to go into it with a big get a beginner's mind because mm-hmm. i think it has you have a lot of power when you go into something a little yeah. naive mm-hmm. because you both don't know how much work it's going to take and you also can 
kind of creatively solve problems that maybe once you've done it a couple times, you sure. get stuck in the mindset of like, oh, this is how it always is done, and mm-hmm. this is what I'm supposed to do. So yeah, there are some things I've learned that we can talk about afterwards, mm-hmm. but uh, perhaps beyond the immediate scope of this of this podcast. But yeah, okay. Cool. And so you're you're trying to go into this with a beginner's mind, and then. Is the book intended to make money or is the book intended to be feed other things in your business? It both, actually. I mean, at the end of the day, the true, true reason I'm doing it is because I want to help other people. Um, This is definitely a project that I would write this book, whether or not, if somebody told me you're going to break even or even lose money, I still would want to write it. Most books do, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I still would want to do it because... I do think that this is Caracotta is my third business. Mm-hmm. I have learned a lot. Um, obviously, not everything or like barely even scratched the surface. But yeah. I'm writing this from the perspective of this is what I wish I would have had ten years ago. I think it yeah. could have saved me a lot of pain and heartache and just spinning in circles and wondering um, where to go next and what That's to awesome. do. So I do want it to serve other pieces of the business as far as um, helping. Like I said past clients but and i would love it to make money but if it doesn't then i'm still gonna do it sounds good yeah sounds good can you think of a time when things went really wrong in your business and what did you do about it (laughs) so many there's been way more failures than successes like sure way more um specifically in this business Uh, sure let's talk about caracotta okay i I can think about a time where you know everything went wrong and you're like i don't know what i'm gonna do yeah this i mean something just happened okay (laughs) perfect i just had a order um the clay the product didn't come out the way that it's supposed to there was a little bit of an issue or contamination in the clay so everything shrunk i was already on deadline and it was way past deadline. I warned the client that it might not be exactly what they're expecting, hoping that it would be okay. Um, I delivered it to a very big hospitality group in Austin. You for sure. I'll tell you after the podcast. But um, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And (laughs) as soon as I dropped it off, their buyer called me and was like, nope, this isn't not going to work for for us. And so huge bummer because it's a ton of lost money with time and the product. And I mean, I feel bad. The thing that's so hard about having a business around your art versus maybe like a software, having the yoga studio is, I mean, this is something that I physically pour my soul into. So when it doesn't work out, the feedback is take it personal. It's rough. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's par for the course. And I kind of knew delivering it that it wasn't going to work. And I think a failure is just a failure if you stop after that. And I literally went back to the clay store that afternoon and just got new clay and threw the whole thing again. And my assistant is actually glazing it right now, okay. the project, the same exact project. Um, so it happens. And the best thing to do, is just like falling over when you're little is just wipe your knees off, get up. And the worst thing I think you can do is spend too much time marinating on messing up okay. and what went wrong. Yeah, this is really cool. I'm, I'm going to have to show this to my sister. My sister actually does ceramics, mm-hmm. and she is just starting to do take exactly the steps. She mm-hmm. does beautiful, amazing work, uh, and she's uh, just starting to take exactly the step of like figuring out uh, how to turn into a business and, and then having to deal with things like that, right? It's rough. I mean, yeah. the, but it's also elating. Like it's, the, it's a double-edged sword because it's the same thing. When somebody has great feedback for you, it's yeah. just like – what you yeah. love this as much as I do it's it's powerful that's awesome that's awesome what is what would you say is the number one thing or piece of advice I mean we got we've talked we've covered so much of this already <laughs> but uh I always ask every guest this so I, I'm gonna ask you if you had to pick one thing for people who are either in a small business right now or thinking about starting their small business what would be the number one piece of advice number one would be Oh, I mean, I have two. One of them is super cliche, which is do something that you love because you're going to do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So really make sure you love the thing that you're doing or just love entrepreneurship, I think is totally fine, too. If you just love being an entrepreneur and you can interchange whatever the thing is that you're doing. And then more like actionable, I guess, is no matter how bootstrapped you are, no matter how tight the budget is, spend the money 
on a good attorney for your um, setting your business up correctly, especially if you have partners, and find a good accountant. So those two things, I think everything else you can fudge <coughs> and you don't need, I think you can do a lot of branding yourself and yep. and you can manage your books yourself, but get an attorney and get yeah. an accountant. We actually had a, an episode, the five things you should have asked your business lawyer. It was mm-hmm. a flash episode we did probably about six months ago. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, we cover all that, all those things. It will save a lot of, that will save a lot of heartache. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Well, this this episode has gone in a, in a really interesting direction, which is not uh, exactly where I thought it would go, but it's really <laughs> fascinating, and I've I've learned a lot, and I, I cannot wait to to read your book, uh, working title unknown yet. So we'll uh, we'll have you back on the show when, when you release the book. Where where can people find your work if they're interested in learning more about Caracata? Yeah, um, Caracata dot com. So it's K A R A C O T T A. Dot com and then on Instagram it's caracata underscore ceramics and that is where I'm the most active as far as sharing uh, product information what I'm up to personally mm-hmm. I share a little bit of business advice but I will be launching a separate Instagram for the book when that time comes awesome and how did you come I mean the name obviously is, your name is Kara and yeah it's like terracotta yeah but like Kara how, how did that flash of inspiration come to you well it's a little bit woo woo too okay let's, so let's close out with that <laughs> woo woo story <laughs> I don't have a ton of vivid dreams and I had a dream this one night and in the dream I was visited by this angel and I know how how out there this sounds so I was visited by this angel and her name was April and she was wearing this really cool modern outfit of like Palazzo pants and like this crop top and in the dream I just remember thinking like wow this this angel is the coolest (laughs) angel ever and she we were in this very bright field and I said, where are we? And it, the colors were more vibrant than I have ever seen before. And just like an asterisk note, I was not on any drugs or anything <laughs> like that. This is totally sober. But she goes, we're in your inspiration. And I, this was around the time that I was noodling on like, can I do ceramics full time? And she said, you will be very successful if you do ceramics. You should name it Caracata. She told me the name of the dream. And then she said, you should lean into using the elements so like the ocean and like the desert which is what the two lines i have right now are called yeah. and i wrote this entire thing down in my phone in my note i woke up it was yeah. like 3 40 in the morning i typed the whole thing out went back to sleep it was two or three years before caracotta came to be wow. this dream happened and everything she told me in the dream actually came true i mean That's i have awesome. these two lines and it just yeah i mean it was Bizarre, yeah. but it leaned into hey, it. Hey, that's so. how Keith Richards from Rolling Stones wrote Satisfaction. He just came up with da 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 Yeah. He came up with that in his sleep, then recorded the tape, and then woke up, and then became a hit song. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I do think that there is, I definitely think there is an angel, other world. Yeah. Um, and I think in our dream state, for whatever reason, we vibrate at a place that they can maybe access easier or something like that. Uh-huh. So don't ignore your dreams. Don't ignore your dreams. Yeah. And, and that is, can be interpreted in many different yeah. ways. And we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You Thank are you incredibly so impressive. And, and, uh, and you have a lot of really uh, great insight. I cannot wait to, uh, to read your book. Oh, thank you so much. Thank All you right. for having me. This was great. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. This is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.